Okay, so we'll just start for a moment uh, centering and reconnecting with the motivation. So if you wanna get yourself gathered and grounded, And so we'll start the way that we finished yesterday. Just briefly visualize Shakyamuni Buddha in the space in front or simple golden light if you prefer, representing your refuge. At his heart is Prajnaparamita, embodiment and representation of wisdom. And at her heart is the heart of the perfection of wisdom sutras mantra, taya taum gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisoa. Light rays radiate out from the mantra garland at the heart of Prajnaparamita who is at the heart of Shakyamuni Buddha. Imagine that these light rays clear obstacles and ripen our ability to connect with wisdom. And adding the mantra to the visualization. Tayata gate gate, arai gate, arasam gate, bodhisoha. Tayata. Gate gate para gate arasam gate body so ha tayata gate gate para gate Arasam gate bodhisoha tayata gate gate para gate arasam gate bodhisoha Tayata gate gate para gate para sam gate body so ha Tayata gate gate para gate para sam gate body so ha and imagine oneself and all other sentient beings gaining a realization of emptiness of inherent existence
Imagine that future possibility in the present moment now. Okay. So you were just watching the teaching by His Holiness. So I thought to give just a very brief summary to make sure you didn't lose the main pieces. His Holiness um, was requested to teach this particular text by Lama Zopa Rinpoche, the head of our organization, the Foundation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition. So in the beginning, you saw Lama Zopa offering a mandala. He had like a, a circular thing with a long tail and he was holding it out with a kata. Um, and he also did the same thing at the end. And this request and thanks is a traditional way to bookend a teaching. It's also, of course, because we don't teach unless we're requested, unless there is receptivity. And so His Holiness is the same. He only teaches when he's requested. So um, Rinpoche requested this teaching on our behalf. And so that's what was happening at the beginning and the end of that um, ceremony. So then His Holiness started out by just explaining that recognizing my mother, an experiential song of the view. Is describing the view of dependent arising. So there are two principles, the philosophical view of dependent arising and then conduct the ethical practice of not harming others, which has to do with world peace. So His Holiness is really um, emphasizing all of his life, but particularly the last 30, 40 years, the idea of secular ethics, the ethics of non-harmfulness that has nothing to do with religion, although can be supported by and reinforced by religion. So the ethical practice of non-harmfulness should be the core of all of our practice, whether we're religious or not, whether we're spiritual or not, ethics should go without saying at this point. Here, the topic is the philosophical view of dependent arising. So this is something that can reinforce your ethics, that can support your ethics, but isn't necessary in order to have ethics, but it certainly helps. So then His Holiness reminds us of the Four Noble Truths, and he does this as a way of pointing to the subject matter of the text, Recognizing My Mother, and inviting us to examine if suffering can be overcome. So the subject matter of Recognizing My Mother is the same subject matter as that of the Four Noble Truths. There's description of suffering, there is allusion to or indirect pointing to karma and mental afflictions, but namely, it's about ignorance and destroying that. And of course, then cessation and path are implied both directly and indirectly, depending on uh, how you're reading the commentary. So His Holiness is trying to explain that this text that's being taught is not some brand new content that you've never heard before or something that Chankya Rope Dorje came up with just from his own side. This is something that's directly connected to the first turning of the wheel when His Holiness taught the Four Noble Truths. But then he goes on to say the explicit subject matter being emptiness, being ultimate truth, means it's actually related to the second turning of the wheel, related to the category that the Heart Sutra belongs to. So it's just to kind of reassure us that this has an anchor in solid, knowable Dharma. And then he invites us to examine 
can suffering be overcome or not? So he's reminding us the first noble truth. And he's reminding us that in order to proceed on this path, we need to look at if we actually believe if suffering can be actually overcome. And then he makes some quotes. Um, most of them are from Chandrakirti um, in Madhyam Kavratara. And one of the quotes he reads out is, through the illuminating light of wisdom, as clear as a mirabalan fruit held in his own hand, he realizes the three worlds as originally uncreated and through conventional truth proceeds to cessation. So then he's kind of upgrading our scholastic connection to this text by saying that recognizing my mother is very related to the middle way teachings, especially as clarified by Chandrakirti. So Chandrakirti was the one who very much uh, together with Nagarjuna explained that sevenfold reasoning, that fourfold reasoning that we looked at in uh, cohort one, when we looked at the diamond slivers and analysis of the chariot. And in cohort two, when we looked more just at the four keys or the fourfold analysis. So Chandrakirti is a very key figure in Tibetan Buddhism, particularly our Nalanda tradition. And so his holiness is saying, remember that teaching, it applies here as well. And the main thing is that he's saying, it's pointing that the solution to suffering is within our own hands. So this Miro Balin fruit held in his own hand, this is like the fruit that Medicine Buddha is holding. You see the um, tanka of Medicine Buddha in the Gompa, I think. There's the um, medicinal flower in his begging bowl, and there's also the medicinal flower that the stem he holds and then blooms up. So this fruit is uh, representing an amazing medicine that heals many ails. The Dharma and one's own wisdom is analogous to that. And then His Holiness quotes Aryadeva, who says, just as the physical faculty permeates all other faculties, likewise, ignorance permeates all other mental afflictions. So ignorance pervades or ignorance imbues or infiltrates all the other mental afflictions or starts all the other mental afflictions. And this is something that we know, but it's a reminder that here is our main enemy in life. This is our main obstacle. This is the thing that is causing all of the trouble. And it can be overcome by understanding dependent origination. So therefore anyone wanting to understand the teaching of the Buddha must be taught dependent origination first at the outset. So not necessarily explicitly emptiness, but helping us understand emptiness via the teaching on dependent origination. And then he goes back to Chandrakirti for a few more verses, namely this one, um, which says, spreading his broad wings of the truths of concealment and suchness, leading the swans of ordinary individuals as this king of swans, soars ahead in the strong winds of virtue and proceeds to the supreme far shore of the victorious one's qualities. So the wings are the main thing to understand here. The two wings are what we need, the wing of wisdom and the wing of method. And these two complementing each other, you will be able to reach Buddhahood at which stage you will overcome all the defilements in one's mind, both afflictive and cognitive. So then it goes down into the verses a bit. And, you know, after this summary, His Holiness really is, um, with this summary from other texts and these quotes from other texts, he's just trying to ground us in what we already have studied and understood and also to reinforce the need to continue to study and understand those great texts. So it's a very skillful means, but then he goes into the verses 
And we went over um, earlier verses yesterday. So I thought that we would um, jump a few and look at basically verse 10, which is where um, the fourfold analysis is pointed to, in particular, recognizing the object to be negated. So you can look at verse 10 or not, you don't need to, but verse 10 reads, there seem to be among today's scholars, some caught in a web of words, like thoroughly withstanding and true existence, who seek only to negate some creature with horns while leaving intact this everyday appearance of solidity. So here is a discussion of the object of negation and how some scholars in their rush to understand emptiness don't understand what exactly is being negated or refuted. So the first step in all of this is to recognize that the inherently existent self cannot be. And in order to recognize that the inherently existent self cannot be, does not exist, is despite our appearances, something that's completely an illusion. First, we have to see what would it be like were it to exist? Because we've always believed that it does. Whether we realize it, whether it's an intellectual understanding, we have an innate grasping at this appearance of inherent existence, particularly related to the self. So we have to recognize it. And then we can move on to ascertaining the two possibilities of oneness and difference of the self. So when we do these fourfold analysis, this is um, the real challenge for us is to make sure that we pause long enough to understand what it is that's being negated. And then don't rush to negate it hold open the possibility that maybe our appearances are as they seem and say, well, then it's either one with or the same as the aggregates, or it's different than or separate from the aggregates. And you look at each of those and you conclude, therefore there is no inherently existent self, but you conclude from a experiential place of deep knowledge intellectual knowledge at first, which then can grow into a realization. But this gradual process, and it can be further elaborated into more steps than this, but this process is how you actually understand the emptiness of the self. Just quietly to yourself, really review what is my own personal understanding of this object to be negated for me as an individual, when I think self, when I think me, when I say my own name, what appears to my mind? What seems to be the core identity? What are defining characteristics of me? You know, and, and kind of like let them live there, you know, don't push against them too much for a second, just kind of, you know, whatever, nationality, gender, I don't know, ideas of intelligence, ideas of, I don't know, financial security. I don't know how we all identify, but what are the like defining characteristics? You know, kind, impatient, whatever. And, and kind of allow them to feel like this is me, whether I hate it or love it, this is me. And then you start to poke very gently so you don't scare away the false self. So when you think of yourself, what is, you know, how do you see it? Or how do you think other people see it? You know, oh, that's such a you thing to do, that way of speaking or that way of communicating in general or that way of being in a community or being in a family, that's so you. What are those so you characteristics? And it's not to say that those characteristics don't exist. They of course exist relatively, no problem. The problem is identification. The problem is ownership. Because as soon as you identify with either good things or bad things about yourself, 
socially acceptable things or socially unacceptable things doesn't matter. But as soon as you start to identify with those things, there is immediately an invitation for conflict. So if you can kind of like wear them like clothing, you don't think that you are your clothing, the clothing is on you, you know, then it's starting to move in, but it's still not quite touching it because then you go even deeper than that surface stuff. And most people don't even look at the surface stuff. They don't even see how things like nationality and race and religion and gender and all of these things are just very superficial ideas of self. That feels core, but you know, we know better now, right? So you go back, you go through those layers and then you look at the mind and the body. Yeah, so you go under the clothes, the body, okay, the body is the self that feels like the self that feels solid and true. And then you look for the body within the body and you can find no body there. And then you look within the mind and anything that feels like the I or the boss is actually just usually a mental factor, taking turns seeming emphasized or dominant. And then you go a step further and you look at the primary consciousness, particularly the mental primary consciousness, and you see that too depends. So this is kind of an inner conversation to have with yourself. What is the object of negation for me? Okay, so nice stable posture. And that was a lot of words. So we'll just start with a few minutes of shamatha before doing analysis. Remembering the motivation we set earlier. In particular, may we realize ultimate bodhicitta. Shift to the breath. And as you observe the breath, let it be an active focus, not a passive focus. Know that you're breathing.
and just stay with the breath without anticipating. And so we'll start with some words from Geshe Nawandage. The first of the four keys is called the essential point of ascertaining the object to be eliminated or negated. We cannot realize emptiness without first knowing what it is that things are empty of. Emptiness is not just a vague nothingness. This first point helps us understand how the false self, the object to be refuted and eliminate, exists. We need to recognize how we view the I as inherently existent, as if it were independent of the aggregates of body, and mind. The eye appears to be substantially established, existent in its own right. And this mode of existence does not appear to be imposed by our own mental projection. Think about the way the self feels extra, feels additional, owned by the aggregates or the owner of the aggregates, but very much a whole distinct entity, not the body or the mind, it seems extra.
The way we hold and believe the I to exist becomes particularly clear when we're angry or afraid. At such times, we should analyze how the self appears to our mind, how our mind apprehends it. We can provoke these emotions in meditation and while maintaining them, use a subtle part of our consciousness to recognize how we conceive our eye. In order to catch a thief, we have to know who the person is and what he or she looks like. The greatest thief of all is our mistaken sense of self. The conception that not only ourselves, but all other phenomena as well are truly existent. We believe that things really exist the way they appear to our senses as objectively established, as existing from their own side. This then is what we have to know in order to catch this great thief who steals all our happiness and peace of mind. If we do not recognize this wrong conception and simply walk around saying emptiness, emptiness, we are likely to fall into one of the two extremes of eternalism or nihilism believing either that things are inherently existent or that nothing exists at all, thus exaggerating or denying conventional reality. Therefore, we must recognize the false self, the object of refutation, before we can start actually refuting or eliminating it. This is the initial step in developing an understanding of emptiness and the foundation of realizing it. First, we must look for the false self, not selflessness. This requires a great deal of meditation. And so maybe think of yourself as a child, an age at which you have some clear memories. Doesn't it feel like it's sort of the same as you now? That that tiny child just gathered more information and more experiences but is somehow essentially the same at the core. Does it feel that way a bit? But if we were able to magically go back in time and observe that tiny child, we might see some quirks and some personality traits that we still have the continuation of now. But we would see a child, a very different lived experience than the one we're having now. We wouldn't see the same person not just the same body, of course, but we would understand from that child's behavior 
that the thoughts and emotions are not the same as the ones we're having now. And whatever we would call fundamental or core to our personality are just behaviors, some of which got reinforced and became more consistent and habitual, some of which weren't reinforced and gradually fell away or stay latent. But there's no findable self there in that child, identical to the one you have now. Or is there? Just explore. So we might have some intellectual doubt about whether the self as a child, that core feeling is the same as the one we have now. But experientially, it still might feel like there's some sort of solidness there. Allow yourself to acknowledge that if that's the case. But be curious. Maybe it seems like the self is the one who remembers. And then you remember that memory is just a function of mind, one of many mental factors, completely dependent, not independent. And then you shift to thinking of adult experiences when you may have been strongly criticized or blamed or misunderstood. And you felt the sense of I roar into life full of defensiveness, full of pain, a sense of threat. how solid that eye feels at such times. How certain of its existence. Doesn't it appear to your mind as inherent, that one who is challenged, 
doesn't it feel like someone was challenged? I was challenged. Inherent I, challenged by inherent you. Just reminding ourselves of how strong these appearances seem. Similarly, if you're praised, maybe if someone you think is very important looks at you, smiles with approval, and says that you're wonderful, the way you might cringe with embarrassment or beam with pride, how escalated the eye feels, how true it feels in such moments. Or that feeling you get when you're in danger, whether voluntary danger, thrill-seeking, adventures, or involuntary danger when there's real threat to your life. Who is the one that feels so alive at such moments? Half happy, half panicked but very vital, awake, very much yourself, very much I. Think of that experience, how inherent it seems.
And in these moments of danger or moments of pleasure, the body feels like self. It feels like absolute intrinsic oneness with the self. If you cut your hand, you say, I cut myself. As if the hand were the self, as if the body were the self. But then when we brush our hair and pieces collect in our comb, we don't think, look at that hair, pieces of myself that I throw in the garbage. Maybe our parents kept our baby teeth when they fell out as a child and we stumble upon them in storage and we don't think, oh, pieces of me. We think, oh, baby teeth, cute. So there are times that the body, all of its parts, some of its parts feels so viscerally self. And there are times at which it doesn't. So which is it? Is the body the self or isn't it? Or is there a whole other possibility? Same for the mind. Main minds, mental factors. Is the self sky-like or cloud-like? Owning both or separate from both? Findable or not? And so just conclude that you will hold open the question, what exactly is the self? And be curious, particularly when the self feels strong or dominant or under threat. Be particularly curious about that one. And so with that idea of the open question, we dedicate. Jan chu sam chu rin poi shay ma ke pa nam ke gyu a chi ke pa nyam pa me pa yi gon he gon du pa wa sho to ni da wa rin poi Ma ke pa nam ke gyo chi ye pa nyam pa me pa yi go ne gon du pa wa sho. Through this energy, may we realize bodhicitta and realize emptiness.
Okay. So um, now you'll have afternoon tea and we'll come back and do question and answers. And